All right, we are in Genesis. Anybody know what chapter we're in? 16. Genesis 16 and verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> it seems to me like it's been a while since we've had class. I mean, we've had the, we've had the gathering and then we had some other stuff happen. And it's just, just been a while. So here we are, and I will try to catch us up then a little bit. Um, let's uh, read verse 7 and 8. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. <clears throat> so what we've discovered prior to this is um, that um, there was a scheme to have the firstborn, the promised seed, the thing that God promised about the life of Christ within us. And we, we came up with, a, you know, actually it was Sarah, but we come up with a plan that is really not going to be Jesus, but it's going to be our best attempts. And, of course, he's not fooled. <laughs> Abraham is fooled. Sarah is fooled. Um, but the Lord is not fooled. He knows his son, and he knows what he's looking for out of us. And so <clears throat> um, we find that after Sarah, or after Hagar, which is the servant, Egyptian servant to uh, Sarah, we find that once uh, they agree, then she immediately conceives, and then the trouble starts between her and Sarah. And um, so... Um, Sarah begins to treat her cruelly, and really the word there is um, um, oppressive, oppressively. And so we went through a bunch of scriptures um, starting in Exodus where um, Israel, when they went down into Egypt after Joseph died, then they became slaves and they were treated oppressively and God delivered them and we went through a whole bunch of different scriptures in different places and we did that to show <clears throat> that God does not just respond to oppression of his people but in general just does not like that spirit because it's the complete opposite of his firstborn okay and um, <clears throat> so um, so Sarah runs, you know, for her life, I guess you'd say. And um, sure, she runs all the way to Shur, and Shur is uh, almost to the border of Egypt, and she was an Egyptian. So um, here she basically collapses and um, apparently um, was dying of thirst or whatever. And so the Lord uh, appears to her. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking about this. Okay, so I, this, this is kind of how my mind runs. I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, okay, Hagar is going to bring forth Ishmael, which will bring forth the Arabs and the people that end up oppressing Israel's people up even unto this day. And he appears, he leaves, as it were, if you will, you can put it like that, he leaves Abraham's camp where Abraham and Sarah are, and he shows up at this place where Hagar is. And I'm going, I'm, I'm just rolling in my mind, I'm going, what are you, you know, Y'all know how I ask these questions, and I think, what are you doing in the enemy's camp? Why aren't you over here with us? You know, why are you there of all places? Um, shouldn't you be with us? Um, you know, uh, we have 
hindsight, we know what's going to come out of her. We know what kind of seed this will be. <clears throat> and so we're going, this is, you know, if you're there to help her, this is not a good idea. We thought, we thought this was the answer where we wouldn't have all this trouble for centuries, you know, to come of fighting with the Arabs, but you show up here with her. <clears throat> Why? Why? And, um, and I believe that the Lord would say to us, I showed up there to test her. <clears throat> All right, I thought God just tested us. I showed up to test her because I am a God that, that uh, brings down those who exalt themselves, and I am the, a God that raises up those who are humbled. <clears throat> and I do that not just within my own people, but I do that within others, but there's certain stipulations that are necessary for me to do this. And that one of the stipulations is that I have to test them. I have to find out, you know, what's working in them. So these simple words here, um, whence camest thou and whither, shall, whither, whither wilt thou go? Or, or why did you come here? Why did you come here? Okay. And that's going to mean everything. The answer is going to sway the Lord because of the way that he is. And her response is, she said, I flee from the face of my mistress. Now, I think it is important to understand that she didn't say, I am running from Sarah because it was unfair. She, you know, she came up with the idea. I didn't. I was just a servant. She came up with the idea. Then as soon as I conceive, then she starts treating me bad. And then it gets so bad that it gets oppressive. And I just, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't bear it anymore. I couldn't stand it. I, you know, I had to get out of there. I had to get away from her. But she didn't say that. She didn't give the reason. She doesn't point out all the wrong. She doesn't stop and say, well, there was this and there was this and she did this and this and this and it's not right and it's not right and it's not right. And you, you know, a lot of times that people do that, they, they continue to raise their voice a little bit. She did this and then she did this and she did this and this and then she did, you know. <clears throat> and then we say, well, you know, I'm not going to come here and exalt something that is also exalting itself. But she didn't do that. So um, the Lord is going to do something here. And I'll skip some. I don't even remember where I was in my notes. But I, um, So the Lord shows up here. And um, at first it says the angel of the Lord. But we find out it was the Lord from the things that began to happen. Um, and like verse 8, this right here, this is the first. Uh, and he said, Hagar, he called her by name. Up to this time, nobody has used her name. The, the narrator writing the story has, but no one has called her Hagar, which is a more intimate thing. It's a first. And, okay, so you go, Lord, you know, none of us have been, <laughs> you know, we, we call her, we, you know, we call her your uh, mistress or whatever the wording is that it uses, but we've, you know, no one has done that, but you are doing that. And why are you doing that? Okay. So we begin to see there's going to be many things in this little bit that is about to come 
we're going to see firsts, 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 firsts. We're going to see a way of relating to Hagar that he basically didn't do with any other woman in the Bible except for uh, Eve, which, of course, he was correcting her when he called her or, you know, when he talked to her, appeared personally, you know. And I forget, a couple other women. But Hagar is one of the only ones. And I'm looking at that and I'm just thinking, that's, this is, there's something going on here that's important in the heart of God. And see, anytime I see stuff like that, I go, there is, that's what, what I just said, there's something going on in the heart of God that's important that apparently I don't know because I would have thought the way I was describing it to you. Whether it's this situation or a situation in my life where someone is oppressing me and um, uh, and they're doing it with in my in my understanding they're doing it without a cause and they're doing it just to spite me and all this kind of stuff and I would you know I would and then the Lord show up at their place and start giving them promises because big promises are coming here it's going to be a big deal I mean not not curses Lord. You know, these people are doing this to me, Why, you know, and I've got all the reasons, you know, like a little checklist in my mind. They are oppressing me and you're showing up over there and talking intimately with them. And you got all these plans and all this stuff and you're giving them all these blessings and everything. And, and then, you know, and you know the other part, right? He tells her to come back. You know, Lord. She's going to have Ishmael among us. You know what I mean? Uh, all kinds of things that we don't understand about God because we have, may I say it, we have a Christian view of things instead of God's view. You know? And, you know, and I'm not putting down the Christian view, but, I, you know, in this situation, it's absolutely wrong. Amen? I mean, you know, I, as I said, we will see things here that he does that no Christian would have ever imagined. Okay. Or why. All right. So let me read a little bit of the notes here then. <clears throat> Hagar answers his question. She's running away from Sarah. But because she does not explain to God why, because she's not explaining why she's running, because that would mean I'd have to really point out the enemy. That means I would have to really go, well, it's because it's not just Sarah, but it's, be, it's Sarah because. Unfair. 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 Okay? I'm telling you, you got to be careful with that word unfair and, and other words that, you know, because you'll look it up, the synonym for it, and start using another word, okay? So it's not just that word, it's the spirit and the thought behind it, okay? Um, <clears throat> but because she does not explain to God why it is that she's running, it could make her look like the bad guy. She's literally not saying to God, it's because she, you know, I'm fleeing from her, that's all. Didn't say I'm fleeing her because she's bad. Or I'm fleeing because I'm good and she's bad. Did you have some? Like, I just like how she says, my mistress Sarah, she still identifies her as her authority. Right. Like, uh, you know, still recognizes Sarah in that position. I'm yeah. not my oppressor, Sarah, my mistress. Right. She, she still sees her as that. That, as that's, that's good. Did y'all hear that? That he's, I, he's, she's identifying Sarah as her mistress, not at, as her tormentor, but as an authority. And so there's respect still going on there. But it was oppressive, folks. That's why God showed up, okay? So we need to understand that, that what was taking place from Sarah was oppressive. All right. 
And that's why God showed up. Because he's, he's going, okay, I need to check this out. I need to get both sides. I need to see this before I act. Okay. Um, and as I said, to not say what she did, just that I'm fleeing from her, could make Hagar look like the bad guy. <clears throat> the question asked by God was a test. Would she pour out contempt towards Sarah? Which, folks, we have people in this church that do that. No, you don't believe that, do you? Okay, I'm going to start naming names. We got... <laughs> we do. Um, uh, would she, and this is the Lord, would, would she pour out contempt? Would she line by line point out all that is wrong with her mistress? Would she put Sarah in as bad a light as she could? And the answer is she didn't. So God stands ready because Sarah did oppress her. That's the language that it uses there in the Hebrew. And Hagar didn't react back to get justice in the way that we think justice is. We don't, we don't really understand justice. Um, so why did God show up and help Hagar? He certainly knew that she would not bring forth the promised seed. Okay, so uh, now let's, let's think about that just for a minute. God knew that she would not bring forth the promised seed. Well, I thought God's only interest was the promised seed. Well, it is as far as life in us, as far as what he wants out of us. But he is also a just God. But see, just because anybody gets oppressed, God doesn't show up and help them. And here's, I'm going to share with you my view of something that I've been mulling over in relationship to that. If you look in the New Testament, several different places, I think James and probably Peter, um, you will see that it says things like God um, um, will bring down those who exalt themselves and will exalt those who humble themselves, right? Okay. Well, I think many Christians in a certain sense think of that in terms of two separate issues. That if God sees somebody that's humbled over here, just humbled, maybe being oppressed, he will exalt them. But if God sees somebody exalting himself over here, he's going to bring them down. I think that's the way we think. But I don't think that's what those scriptures mean. Can you see how you would come to that conclusion? Here's what I think, and just because I think this doesn't mean it's so, but but here's what I'm going to base it on. I'll say before I tell you what <coughs> my view is, I'm going to show you uh, a certain thing. Have you ever seen somebody <coughs> that was oppressive and had exalted themselves and was over people and never got dealt with? I have. And never. Never got dealt. Have you ever seen somebody humbled and poor and under the, what we used to say, under the gun, you know, that stayed that way their whole life and never got exalted, even though they were in a humbled situation? Okay, so that was what made me think about this. You know, I mean, things like that make me think. I go, wait a minute, what? if that's true, why, is, why are all these, you know, I mean, remember, I got saved saying the Bible contradicts itself and trying to prove it. And God showed up and said, he didn't say anything. He didn't say the Bible doesn't contradict itself. He just revealed himself to me as the word of God. So from then on, when I see a contradiction, I go, okay, there's got to be some reality of him here. Okay, well, I was looking at this reality, and I thought, <clears throat> I thought, you know what? 
those things, those two concepts are put together all the time. They're never one is said here and then one over here, but rather if someone is being uh, humbled, it's probably by someone who is exalting themselves and God will do both of those at the same time, he will bring them down and raise them up. Now you see that with Joseph and you see that in all kinds of different situations in the Bible. That it really is, those two things work together. And in this case, Sarah was lording it over Hagar and Hagar was being pushed down and God said, okay, this is one of those situations. I'm going to check it out. You see, if again now, under that light, if Hagar had have said, well, she's just, she's just mean, or she's just, then she wouldn't have been humbled. So God said, when she heard from Hagar, he said, okay. We're going to deal with this situation. And the situation I've, I've mentioned before, and I think we've even gotten into it. Haven't we gotten into this somewhat? Okay, so, um, well, we'll see where I'm at here on all that. Um, what brought him there? What brought the Lord there? His, uh, I put his presence begs the question, whose side has God on? And I remember us discussing this before. We asked the question, who, since he seems to be out in the wilderness with her and not at Abraham's camp, uh, we ask, since he shows up to help the mother of the enemy of Abraham's seed, we ask, since he is the first to breathe forth her name, which seems rather intimate, whose side is God on? So then verse 9, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her oppressive hands. Okay. Well, that makes it sound like he's on Sarah's side. But he's not. He's not. He, he works by certain principles. And if we don't understand the Lamb, then we don't understand God. I don't care what you think you know of him, if you don't understand the land, because he's asking her to do what it would require him to move to deal with her. Now, in your minds in the story, those of you who know the story, you will look through it and go, well, Sarah, Sarah was great. She was, you know. But we're going to find out that Sarah really wasn't that great in the eyes of the Lord. And in fact, we're going to find out that she sort of stands in the way of important things. Okay. So God's checking the hearts. He's checking the hearts. He's checking how much of the lamb is formed in us. How much is, is the lamb not formed in us? Uh, so he's going to put, he's going to, instead of delivering Hagar from that situation, he is going to put her in a situation whereby he can bring forth the promises that he's about to give to her. It'll all be based on the lamb. It'll all be based on going through this in the spirit that God wants. Okay? So, um, uh, he tells Hagar to return and to bear the suffering that Sarah dishes out. Suffer by her hand. The word is the same as in verse 6. Deals harshly. Suffer or let her deal harshly with you. Okay? All right. So uh, let me just give you a couple of scriptures here and we can read them. Keep, keep your place where you're at. Let's go to Matthew 23. Now we get to read one of those scriptures. <clears throat> Matthew 23. Okay, let's look at verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Okay, now let's look at the verse in front of it. 
But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's the heart of the Lord right there. That's the spirit of, of the Lord. That's the lamb at work. That's, that's his way. That's the way that he proceeds. So he's saying, you know, if you're, if you're seeking to be great outside of that spirit, then it's not going to happen because whosoever shall exalt himself because you're seeking to be great. Greatness doesn't come from, from exalting yourself over weaker people so that you can be great. Folks, that's not just big time stuff. That's little things. That's how we treat people. Maybe we only have one person that we do that to. It's still wrong. It's still not his spirit. It's still not what he wants out of us. You see? Shall be, shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself. So here the humbling, here, catch this, please. Here the humbling is in the tenor of God saying to Hagar, go back and humbly carry out what I've called you to do in spite of that. And certain things are going to be happening then as a result of this. What do you think? <laughs> All right. Let's go to First Peter. <clears throat> First Peter 5. Um, the last part of 5 and verse 6. So I'm going to start at uh, 1 Peter 5, the latter part of it. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Uh, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Okay, several things here. It's right here. All of you. Be subject one to another. Okay, what's that saying? Is that saying, uh, well, it's anarchy. There's no, there's no leadership. There's no authority or whatever. No, no. He's not talking about in terms of that. He's talking about in terms of spirit. You know, there's a difference per se between, uh, okay, now, don't get mad at me, but I'm going to give an example of my childhood, and if it matches yours or it matches how you deal with your kids, that's between you and God. My stepfather used to say, um, uh, you're not going to do that, and if you do that in my house, then uh, you're not going to do it here, so I'm going to kick you out. You do as I say. Anybody ever experienced that kind of stuff? You know, um, It was worse than that, but that was one. That was a mild version of it. Okay. Um, this is talking about carrying forth the authority in a different spirit. Did Jesus do it? Did Jesus carry it forth in a different spirit? I know almost everybody, you know, I've taught this before and somebody came up and said, well, Jesus drove the money changers out, man. You know, I said, oh. You know, that, yeah, that's got another one. <laughs> you know. And I said, that was a picture, too, for us. We're the temple of God, and he's going to come in there and clean out what we can't do. Are you okay with that, buddy? <laughs> so, you know, it's not that. It's, it, it, his spirit is backed up by the authority of God. Submit yourselves one to another and be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Um, you know, I just had someone tell me recently, well, that's, you know, to, to um, speak, to minister in a, or to lead with a spirit of humility was completely new to them. Um, that they had never noticed that before 
in the church. They only heard the words. So you could say, would you, would you go and uh, do so and so? You know, we need, would you go back there and bring in the chairs or help bring in the chairs? They might hear that as just a command. They may not, and, and then what they said was, only recently have I noticed that some people do that in this church in a very humble spirit. Well, I was blessed by that, you know, because I know that to be true. I mean, I hear it all the time. I hear the Lord. I see the Lord I, uh, all the time. But that's a big step to be able to all of a sudden realize that you can lead, but you have another spirit in it. You're not trying to exalt yourself. You're trying. See, the Lord is funny like that, you know. I mean, I'll give you an example. Now, only, that's the only reason why I give examples of my life is because it's the only life I know growing up, you know. Um, but when I was in Bible school, you know, the Lord started really dealing with me about the lamb. And it wasn't through the teachers or everything. It was the Lord was dealing with me about that. And about him as a, as a lamb and that that was his true nature. And so I began to realize that that's what he was calling for out of me. So in different situations would come up, I would, I would just submit, but, not, but it wasn't submission, see, it was the lamb. Does that make sense? At least this, in words. <laughs> and I would just go, you know, yeah. And I found after a while, this is easy. You know, some people might think, but I was going, this is easy. You know, somebody tells you what to do and you just do it in the spirit of the lamb. You do it in the spirit of Christ. You do it in the nature of Christ crucified and you just do it. You don't have to be somebody. You don't have to push yourself forward. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to have a, a position to, to make things happen or whatever. So then one day the Lord came to me and he said, you know, I want you to be a leader. And I, you know, went back and thought about it. And I thought, how do you be a leader with the spirit of the lamb? It really, did, it just seemed impossible to me. How do you do that? Because the way I was doing it, I was just ready. It wasn't, again, it wasn't submission. It was the lamb, but it looked like submission. But it wasn't submission because submission can be something we do. You know, a passive person can be submissive. God's not looking for us to be passive. He doesn't mind us carrying forth the things that he's given us. You know, and he puts everybody in some sort of an area. And every one of us are supposed to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. You know, a, a good example of that, and we've seen that, but, but uh, I've heard Scott say it. And he said, he said even fairly recently, you know, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, he said, you know, here I am, one of the, the two pastors in, uh, in the church, and uh, I go to Ireland, and that's Kelly's ministry, and I'm under her and the things that she's doing in the Lord, so I submit to that. Say, so, no, no, I want to be a overlord all the time. I want to have control, and I want it all the time. I want people to, you know, we can say respect me. Okay, good. I know some people who want people to fear them. That's the way they, they it's like that's how intimidation and fear is how they keep control of everything and make it smooth but it's not smooth because it's not, it's devoid of the very nature of Christ, see. So, so he's calling for us in this situation. And he's even saying, if you're a Hagar, you line up with me and you will see, and we will see, you will see that God will still back you up. Now, just because he backed up Hagar doesn't mean that he forever backed up Ishmael 
or all those who were of Ishmael. Because this was a personal thing he asked of her. Do you understand? And she did it. Okay? She did do it. And she did it in that spirit. The scriptures seem to bear that out. You know, I mean, there were some issues, but what do you expect from somebody who's not of the seed anyway? You know, I was, I was impressed. I mean, when I really understood what she did, I knew why God called her Hagar used her name and said Hagar instead of, you know, the maid. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud. Okay, so, um, so we go, man, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to carry out my job or I'm trying to carry out my ministry and people are... Making it hard on me. Okay? And God resists the proud. He'll get you. No, no, he's going to get you. <laughs> you know? I mean, we have, we have enough problems with the devil. We don't need to be putting ourselves in a position to get God resisting us too. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? But that's what it says right here. Now it's, it's like this. Now you've moved over into territory where you're resisting me. In your pride, you're resisting me. And now you've moved into territory where I'm going to be resisting you. Man, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't ever want that. <laughs> I want to be exactly in that spot that he has me. I want to, I want to be carrying out, you know, we make, we're going to make mistakes. All of us make mistakes. Particularly in leadership, you make mistakes. You know, I, I, know, that, I know that my heart is to do what God wants with all my heart as far as what I know, but I still mess up. And I still make mistakes. I still do stupid things at times. And it just... It just bothers me because when I make mistakes, it's bigger than if you make mistakes. You know what I mean? It affects more people. And that's, you know, and if you're God's sheep, I definitely don't want that. If you're just people, well, that's another thing. Well, it's a church and you're just people. No, but if you're God's sheep, even if it's an accident, as it were, Oh, I still, that strikes me to my core. I don't want that. See, because why? Well, you know, if I'm a shepherd, I'm an under-shepherd. There's the great shepherd that's over me, and he's great. I'm under-shepherd, and I'm a dork. He's the great shepherd, and I'm the dork shepherd. Okay. But... But I seek him. I seek him. But see, I'm not seeking not to make mistakes. I'm seeking for the thing that caused me to make the mistake. And many times it can be pride or ego or this or that. Or, or maybe I've, I've, I'm so focused on what I want to get done that I'm leaving his spirit out of it. Those kind of things. That's where I think it counts. See, because listen, listen to the scriptures that we're reading. And there's tons of them. I mean it. I'm not joking. I am telling you there are tons of scriptures along this line. And, and so you, you begin to realize this is, this is a spirit that he's talking about. You know, I resist the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore. Okay? So you go, Lord... You know, I, I need grace. But I don't need grace for mistakes that are nothing short of just me not wanting to flow with the nature of the Lamb, but to get a job done. Amen? Come on, that's, that's our heart. That's got to be our heart. It's Him first. You know? I mean, this is all temporal. This will all pass away, right? This will all pass away. But we're going to be with him. And, 
you know, I don't want to get up there and find a, and you hear me put that kind of language, but I don't want to get up there and find a, you know, a big old glorious sheep pasture with green pastures and still waters and all that, and over here a goat bin that he, you know, pen that he keeps the goats in. You know, go over there, Randy, that's where you're going to spend eternity, you know. Actually, you know, in Matthew 25, it's a little worse than a goat pen in heaven, okay? So, <laughs> but, but I'm trying to point out, I don't want to be cordoned off from Jesus, you know? I mean, I love those scriptures, too, in Matthew 25, when he says, and he, and he separates. He didn't say he divides. It says he separates the sheep from the goats. And I love that it says he separates the sheep from the goats as a shepherd. Mm -hmm. Shepherd, sheep, mm -hmm. herd, not goatered. <laughs> He's not a goatered. See, he's separating or he's, he's putting them where they are spiritually. He's putting them where they are nature-wise, see. He doesn't say, goat, come up here. Uh, so what was your ministry? It was bad, you know. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. He's, he's not going to, he looks at their nature. That's what's important. That's what he's talking about right here. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Okay, so we say, okay, God, put your mighty hand on me. I'm so full of pride. Put it on there. Lay it on me. God, come on, you said, you said you were going to do it, and I need it. And he's going, amen, you know. And, but we don't notice that it doesn't just say God's mighty hand will fall on you and humble you. It says humble yourself. Humble yourself. And he will exalt you in due time. All right, so... Back to Hagar and all them. So now we're in that situation. He says, go humble yourself. Go submit yourself under that kind of treatment. Most of Christianity would rebel against such teaching. What? God doesn't want that to happen to me. I'm supposed to be victorious. I'm a, you know, I'm a king's kid. Which... You're not Jesus' kid because he's the king. You're not Jesus' kid. At best, you're his brother or sister. That's what it says in Hebrews. Right? So even the, even the concept is wrong within it. Well, I'm a king's kid. No, you're not. <laughs> you know, read your Bible. Look closer. You know, stop exalting yourself. See? I mean, you know, I've, I've been in services where, you know, we're waiting for the big, you know, evangelist or whoever to walk on stage, and they walk up and go, Jesus is Lord! And everybody goes, yeah, yeah! And, you know, I'm looking around thinking, these people didn't know that before? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know, I know, I'm different, and I admit it, okay? But it's, it was like, Man, we should have been living this a long time ago, you know? You're just getting this? He's Lord and we're supposed to be under Him. Under, that's humble. Under Him. Not become lords. Not become great people. What was, what was that? And he that should be greatest among you should be your servant. Okay, see... Don't try teaching that in one of those kind of meetings, although I have. Because, you know, I've done conferences all over the world, and I've been in those kind of meetings, and they had asked someone who had invited me to preach, and so I get up there and say, well, let's turn in our Bible, to, you know, and I start in. 
And of course, you know, some people want to just drag you out and beat you because you're, you're saying the exact opposite of what everybody believes. But there's always some that come up and go, oh my God, the Lord hit me so hard in what you were saying. And I realized it was the Lord, it wasn't me. See, it wasn't what I was saying, it was the Lord. And they were ready and they heard it. And the Hagars of this world can hear it, if you will, if you understand what I'm saying. And they will, res they will respond to his submission. And what's the end result of that? He will exalt you in due time. Okay? Well, when is that coming? You know, if you're going like this, uh, Lord, you know, what is that? I've been here six months and I'm ready to, <laughs> you know, or, you know, God, hurry up. Hurry up with what? The exalting? How about he says back to us, hey, hurry up with the lamb, the spirit of it. Because it's, think about it, it's not humble yourself under the situation and go, I'll, I'll hold my breath, I'll do whatever I have to do uh, as long as I have to, to get out of this. Well, then you don't, you don't have the spirit of the whole thing. You're just doing something. You're waiting for the time where you'll break out. Now, I know all of this because I sat in Bible school myself for a long time thinking that way and going, well, okay. I mean, I was like a hidden agent. <laughs> I was, you know, everybody else was real spiritual and they were all going after God in that way. And I was like, uh-uh. <laughs> I was. It was like, this ain't me. You know, I only came to this Bible school because the Lord told me. You know, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, you know, I don't plan on living this way because I had been with Kenneth Copeland for, you know, that's the ministry I was involved with before I went to that Bible school. And it's like, yeah, you know, and, you know, higher, bigger, greater. And everybody's going, yeah, you know, <laughs> and then I come to this Bible school and they're going smaller, lower, and I'm going, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm doing it under cover. No, what'd you say? No, <laughs> you know, until bam, the Spirit of God got me. And, and I will tell you this that this stand needs help, but <clears throat> y'all time it and see how long it takes to get back down again. It's moving about as fast as some of you go toward the lamb. <laughs> I think I found a way to keep it up. Let's see, let me get it up here. I know you think I'm wasting time. That's, that's where it'll end up. The Lord will say, I'll show you. I'm talking about getting lower and I'm using the object lessons on you and you're taping them up. You're taping them, Randy. <laughs> you think that's me or you? All right, yes, Lord. What time is it? Okay. Uh, verse, verse, uh, Let's look at verse 10. <clears throat> and the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. This is, man, God is responding to her. God is responding to the spirit in which she's handling it, to the fact that she didn't start with, you know, like we go before the throne of, the throne of grace, you know, right? And we go, Lord, so-and-so is doing this to me, and it's wrong, and it's bad, and you need to deal with them, and they did this and all that, right? Right? We, that's, that's, just a, that's called a prayer in our book. God's calling that an offense to the Lamb. See? And, and we think, well, he's hearing all that because he said he would exalt the humble. Well, you hadn't been humbled yet. 
Where's the lamb? See, the, the humbling isn't acting humble for a while until he exalts you. It is the lamb being formed in you more. See? Where you can, where you can be with him. Well, what did Paul say? I have learned in whatsoever state I find myself therein to be content. Now, we all know this scripture, but this, this guy learned. See, we've heard. He, I learned in whatever state, it doesn't matter. See, there was a class I was teaching, and what did I call this? Um, what was it? It was, uh, what? The hypnosis class. I don't remember what class, but it was, I called it, um, let's see, unconditional. I think I just said that he's, un, he's unconditional. We say God has unconditional love. I say God is unconditional. I say we're conditional. I say we have to have conditions set up before we can be what he wants, before we can at least act like what he wants, even if it's not the real thing. He's unconditional. You can put Jesus over here in the fiery furnace. You can put him over here in the lion's den. You can put him in all these things. You can hang him on a cross, and he's going to be with the Lord. It doesn't matter. You can, you can put him on a donkey and send him into Jerusalem and everybody waving branches and everything, and he's not going, yeah. <laughs> Finally, you know, this is it. I knew it was going to happen to me. No. He came in lowly, it says. Anybody remember that? See, we missed something there. When everybody else is trying to get his ego up, he comes in lowly. And so he's unconditional. The conditions don't matter to him whatsoever state. Totally unconditional. Which says, unconditional love for me. You know, what's the payoff on saying that? The payoff is I can do anything wrong and he's going to put up with me. <laughs> That's the exact opposite of him being unconditional and it doesn't matter. Pharisees can be raging against him over here. You can have Mary of Bethany pouring oil on him. He's not, he, you know, he's just going to be with the Father. And he's going to do it in a spirit that's lowly, you know. Maybe I should stop because it's going into a good part here. I'm sorry I had to put up with the bad part here up to this point, but next time. Here it is. Don't you love Jesus? Man, don't you want to love him more than you ever have before? Wouldn't you like every time we get together to be more than it ever was, than it was before? That there can be an increase of loving him and wanting him and, and having a heart that says, I just want you, Lord. I don't, it's not things, it's not what I think I need down here, it's what you think I need in you. I want that, I want that, I want that. Someone would say to you, well, what? You don't know what that is. You may not want that. If it comes from him, whatsoever state I find myself, I want that. And, and that's not a, that's not playing around saying that. That is, I want that. I want what's, what he thinks in his heart pertaining to who he is. I want that in me. And I don't want to just be seeking him for what he does. Because if he did something new every day that was miraculous, there's a good chance I would... I would just level off eventually and just expect it and not love him more every day or seek him more every day or I would just get used to those things and then if he stopped doing those then I'd be upset with him. Whatsoever state I find myself is conditional. You know, 
I'm conditional. He's unconditional. Father, we just ask you to help us to understand the things that you're trying to say, not, not the things that I am. Lord, what you have here in your word and what you've shown in the scriptures, but beyond the scriptures. Those things came from your heart. That's your word, but the word came from the abundance of your heart. And Father, make it real and make it the living lamb. Make it glorious to you. Make it, make it shout glory, even as it's in Hagar being asked to submit to oppression. Father, you will deal with Sarah in her time. We ask, we ask for the spirit that you're trying to communicate to us more and more and more, more of you. And that's when we say more of you and less of us, that's what we mean. That's what we're pointing to. We're not pointing to more, more throne for us, more position, more highness. We're talking about more of your nature and no, so that in whatever state, if you put us up high, we would submit ourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, even as we carried out what you called us to do. In other words, we would have your spirit. So make it real in us. Make our hearts yearn for it. Put us in a position where we don't hear it and yearn for it at the moment while it's being shared, but that we walk out of this place yearning and saying, I want that, I want that, Father. That we would stop and pray and say, Father, I don't even know what it is I want, but I know I want what your son is and who he is and how he is. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.